So then we're prepared to look at the actual Davidic covenant here. The Davidic covenant is stated in two different places in scripture. Uh, one in 2 Samuel and the other in 1 Chronicles. Uh, first and 2 Samuel, actually the kings and um, Samuel and the kings are repeated in the books of Chronicles because um, Samuel and kings was written before the exile and Chronicles was a restatement of their history once they came back from the exile uh, and were being led by Ezra. Um, so it was, this is a um, pre-exilic text, whereas First Chronicles is a post-exilic text. Uh, so they are a little bit different, but it's for a very specific purpose that they're very, or that they are slightly different. So here in Second Samuel, uh, we see the Davidic covenant stated in its immediate purpose, this Solomonic focus, this focus on the immediate descendant, Solomon. Uh, we'll have it in seven different um, provisions that we find in this text. And these are all listed by Arnold Fruchtenbaum. Um, I didn't go through and write this list. And in fact, I would probably write it a little bit different. Um, but this is how he did it. And I, uh, I thought this was best done besides, uh, unless I wanted to go through and uh, spend a couple more hours than I already have on it, which I might later, but didn't now. Anyways, the seven provisions that Arnold Fruchtenbaum sees in this um, covenant are a uh, promise to David of an eternal dynasty, that Solomon would be established on David's throne after David um, departs. So he has um, a descendant of his own and not the throne being taken from him like Saul and given to another, uh, that Solomon would build the temple and not David that David's throne and Solomon's kingdom would last forever. Um, now, this has more to do with what we're going to look at in First Chronicles, this forever uh, promise of the kingdom. It also promises that Solomon would be disciplined for disobedience, but that God's loving kindness would not be removed from him. Solomon is going to commit a lot of the very same uh, errors that Saul committed, uh, but we see that God's promise to bring about the messianic line through David will not be thwarted uh, by Solomon's disobedience. So that is why God takes it away from Saul, but not from Solomon. It's not because Solomon was a better guy or a better king, but because, but because God had made promises that God would bring about. Uh, so number six, that the Messiah would come from the seed of David and that the Messiah would rule on David's throne forever. So these are the provisions that when we put uh, 2 Samuel and the First Chronicles passage together, this is what emerges from the Davidic covenant. So let's look at the 2 Samuel uh, covenant first. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7, it says, Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant, and this is God speaking to the prophet Nathan, um, who was a prophet under David. Uh, you shall say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be a ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and I will make you a great name, like the names of the great men who are on the earth. So here, this is how we know that God is making some sort of a covenant uh, because he's using these I will statements. This tells us what kind of covenant as well. It's an unconditional covenant. We don't see any if-then structures in the text. It's all I will, I will, I will, with no requirements put on David uh, for these promises to come to pass. So first here he says, I will make you a great name. This is a lot like the promise that he gave to Abraham, when he told Abraham that he would make him a great name. I will also appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they, will, that they may live in their own place and not be disturbed again. This is a lot like our land covenant. Nor will the wicked afflict them anymore as formerly. Um, so adding in their provisions of peace. 
even from the day that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord also declares to you that the Lord will make a house for you. Uh, so here, these, uh, these peace stipulations, first of all, have never come to pass. Uh, there was a period of peace under Solomon, but it did not last, and it went immediately into uh, civil war and war from all sides. So Israel has continually, through its history, been in, uh, afflicted by war, both eternal and external. This part of the Davidic covenant has never come to pass, but this is all looking forward to the Messiah, Jesus Christ, ruling over the kingdom um, on the throne of David in Jerusalem in the Messianic kingdom, the millennial kingdom after the tribulation. Uh, Moving forward here, when your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will rise up your descendant after you, who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. So this is why we say the second Samuel passage has a Solomonic focus, because this is focusing on a descendant that would come immediately from David's body. Uh, that this would be his direct descendant, Solomon, uh, and that God is going to establish Solomon's kingdom for him. Solomon's not going to be the one establishing his own kingdom. So we read, he shall build a house for my name, that will be the, Solom uh, the temple of Solomon, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Um, so here we do have a forever uh, stipulation, even in this second Samuel um, section. I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. And then when he commits iniquity. So this passage, again, cannot refer to Jesus Christ, but this, um, just like we saw in the previous verse, is referring directly to Solomon. Um, it says, I will correct him with the rod of men and the strokes of the sons of men. But my loving kindness shall, shall not depart from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I re removed from before you. And then God summarizes, your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words and all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. So that's the Davidic covenant, the promise given to David that David understood that he would have a forever kingdom. And as far as David was able to see was only to Solomon. Past that, he had to rely on God that his throne would last forever. He would get to see Solomon, uh, but he would not get to see descendants beyond that take his throne. But after the exile, when Israel has uh, has been divided for centuries when uh, the northern kingdoms had been taken off into Assyria and dispersed, and then the southern kingdoms taken into Babylon and returned after 70 years. There were efforts to rebuild the temple, to rebuild Jerusalem, and uh, to recapture their history. In fact, when they came back, they after 70 years, they were no longer speaking uh, Hebrew, they were speaking Aramaic. Um, so there were many campaigns to recapture their history, just like we're seeing today with the return of, uh, of the uh, Jewish nation to the land of Israel. Uh, they've returned the use of the shekel, they have returned to using their uh, language Hebrew. Uh, many of the same things happened under Ezra when they returned from Babylon. Uh, and one of the things that they did was they, uh, was they went in and they rewrote their history, and they didn't revise their history, but they wrote out their history again. Um, so here is uh, First Chronicles account of this prophecy given to David uh, through the prophet Nathan. So in First Chronicles 17, starting in verse 10, we read, Moreover, I tell you that the Lord will build a house for you when your days are, for, are fulfilled, that you must go to be with your fathers, that I will set up one of your descendants after you who will be of your sons. So this is a little different. 
this is not one or uh, this is not your descendant who will come from your body, but one of your descendants who will come from one of your sons. Uh, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build for me a house, and I will establish his throne forever. Continuing, we read, I will be his father, and he shall be my son, and I will not take my loving kindness away from him, as I took it away from him who was before you. Notice there is nothing in here about this descendant committing any iniquity because it would be the sinless son of God, the God-man, Jesus Christ, that this is pointing towards. But I will settle him in my house and in my kingdom forever, and his throne shall be established forever. So the Davidic covenant promises four eternal things to David and to the line of David, that there would always be a kingdom for them to rule over, that there would always be a house and a dynasty through which they would rule. There would always be a descendant who would rule, and there would always be a throne on which he would rule. And right now, Jesus Christ um, is that eternal descendant that once we got to Jesus Christ, there need be no descendants past him because Jesus Christ is the king of Israel and uh, the king of the Jews, and that was even written on his cross in recognition of that by Pilate. Uh, ironic recognition, nonetheless, but recognition. And we see that David did understand uh, this covenant given to him, that although it was given to him uh, directly relating to his son Solomon, David understood that what was what would be said later in 1 Chronicles 17 was true. So we read in Psalm 89, and Psalm 89 and Psalm 132 are basically Davidic covenant psalms. When we read through those, uh, it's all filled with the hope that God gave him through this covenant. Um, so Psalm 89, I'm just going to take a few verses from that relate more closely to our uh, Revelation study. So he says here, I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to David, my servant. I will establish your seed forever and build up your throne to all generations. Um, again, going beyond Solomon there. I also shall make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. My loving kindness I will keep for him forever, and my covenant shall be confirmed to him. So I will establish his descendants forever and his throne as the days of heaven. And in verse 34, my covenant I will not violate, nor will I alter the utterance of my lips. So remember, God is not a man that he should change his mind. God made this covenant. He will bring it to pass. And this is a comfort to David, uh, because even though David himself had many personal failures and his son um, had far more personal failures, God would not change his covenant with David. Um, there would be an eternal throne that one of his descendants sits on. So in verse 35, once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His descendants shall endure forever and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever like the moon, and the witness in the sky is faithful. Now, God makes similar promises. Uh, like you could use the example of the new covenant in uh, Jeremiah 31, uh, where God also relates that to the sun, the moon, and the stars. That as long as the sun, the moon, and the stars remain in the sky, these covenants are still in force. So when anyone tells you that uh, this, this covenant is no longer in force, which I don't know why you would be in a conversation like that necessarily, uh, but just tell them to go outside and look up, and if there's a sun, moon, or stars, uh, then they're wrong. Um, and you can point them here to Psalm 89 or Jeremiah 31. Um, I guess you could say, if anyone ever tells you God's done with Israel, tell them to go look up outside. Uh, Psalm 132, verse 10 for the sake of David, your servant, do not turn away the face of your anointed. The Lord has sworn to David a truth from which 
he will not turn back. Of the fruit of your body, I will set up your throne. If your sons will keep my covenant and my testimony, which I teach them, their sons also shall sit upon your throne forever. Now, we're not going to go over this tonight, but there was one in the line of David um, who did not keep God's covenant, and his line was cut off from participating in this promise, and that's uh, Jeconiah, uh, I think in Isaiah, maybe, it, he's uh, called Konia, or, uh, maybe that's in Jeremiah, he's called Konia, um, but that's the same man, uh, Jeconiah was cut off from being in this uh, seed line promise because of his unfaithfulness. Uh, but nonetheless, it is confirmed to David and will not fail to, uh, to come about as a promise to David. Uh, for the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desi desired it for his habitation. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. There I will cause the horn of David to spring forth. I have prepared a lamp for mine anointed. His enemies I will clothe with shame, but upon himself his crown shall shine. Now this, I think, is really important, especially remembering back to our previous foundation study in the land covenant, that David's throne isn't just anywhere. David's throne is not in heaven. Jesus Christ is not sitting on the throne of David today. Jesus Christ will sit on the throne of David when the throne is established in Zion in Jerusalem. Um, it can be in no other place, and if it is in any other place, then God has lied to David, which he said he would not do. Um, so this will be a literal earthly reign of Jesus Christ, the seed of David, on the throne of David in literal earthly Jerusalem. Uh, that has not happened yet. We are still looking forward and waiting for this to happen.